Immigration is a hot topic in the economics and political space. Many attribute the success of Donald Trump's 2016 election and the Brexit referendum to fears people have regarding immigration. Often invoked are fears of native workers' wages decreasing or native workers being displaced entirely by new immigrant arrivals. But are these fears founded in any empirical fact? Are native employment or wages negatively affected by immigration? Today I'd like to offer a brief overview of immigration as an economic issue. The fear of immigrants taking the jobs of native workers is not new, but it's also not well founded. In a survey of immigration and its impacts, economists and economics power couple Sari Pakala Kerr and William Kerr found that the available literature shows little effect on native employment as a result of immigration. An analysis by economist Alan Debra examines immigration's impacts on income. Debra found that immigration has either a small impact or no impact at all on native wages. This amounted to a 0% to a 2% decrease in native wages as a result of a 10% increase in immigration. But these analyses raise a few important questions. How would an increase in the supply of labor not definitively and substantially cause a decrease in wages and or native employment? After all, if supply shifts to the right, shouldn't the price of labor fall proportionately, and shouldn't natives find it tougher to come by a job? And if we assume at least the wage effects on native workers are indeed negative, albeit small, should governments accept even a small negative impact on wages on the native population? In order to answer the first part, we have to think more comprehensively about the effect of immigration on the broader economy. In a vacuum, it does indeed make intuitive economic sense that immigrant workers would decrease native workers' abilities to obtain employment and a decent wage, because the labor pool got bigger and the competition for those jobs will increase. However, there is an aspect to the model that many anti-immigration activists forego in their analysis the demand for labor. Immigrants, when they come to a country, need to obtain things like housing, food, and utilities. Of course, those are necessities, but also immigrants, much like native populations, desire things more broadly than simple necessities, such as entertainment, consumer goods, and an assortment of many other goods and services. Immigrants shift the supply of labor to the right, of course, but they also shift demand to the right, which makes analyzing immigrants' effects on wages and employment more complicated than the Tucker Carlson analysis of, well, the price of something goes down when there's more of something. That's why sand is cheap. This increase in demand significantly offsets downward pressure on wages. However, it's also worth noting that any downward pressure on wages is not necessarily equally distributed. This makes logical sense. Of course, an influx of low-skilled immigrants in Arizona probably isn't causing the nurse in Massachusetts to obtain lower wages, despite the potential scale of immigration. Not all native workers directly compete or are directly substitutable for new immigrant arrivals. At the same time, this brings me to the second question on wages. Should we be accepting of immigration if it means potentially disproportionate, albeit small, impacts on wages are felt by native workers? Well, the answer is yes, and I'll explain why. Economies need but a few things in order to ensure long-term economic growth, labor, capital, and technological advancement. A simple equation, sure, but very reasonable once thought through. Of course, if you have all the labor in the world with no capital for that labor to work on, your economy probably isn't going to grow very well in the long term. This is true vice versa. Of course, if you have all the capital in the world but not enough labor to work it, your economy also probably won't grow very well. And at the same time, if we're talking about long-term economic growth, Growth, you're going to need technological advancement to push the boundaries of your economy's productive capacity. Let's talk about the L in this equation. Developing and developed nations across the board have experienced a decline in birth rates. It seems a universal constant that when people become higher income and have additional access to education, they desire less children on average. Since labor is a key determinant of long-term economic growth, the most developed nations, who typically have the lowest birth rates, must rely on immigration to obtain the population necessary in order to continue to grow and prosper. Also, no for the people in the comments, restrictive access to birth control and abortion have not been shown to effectively reverse the trend in declining birth rates. Of course, if there are less people to sell products to over time and less people to work in factories producing those products, the economy will be less likely to grow and extend those products and services to the domestic and international population. Increased competition for labor is a good thing for businesses, but of course there is a balancing act. What's definitely not good for people or businesses is the artificial restriction of people entering the economy, forcing the pool of labor to be lower than the natural demand for labor. This increases the wages of those able to obtain employment marginally for sure, but it also 
decreases a business's ability to invest in the other two key factors of long-term economic growth, capital and technology. Businesses having a hard time finding workers forces them to pay higher wages artificially, thus restricting their ability to expand and invest. But Econoboy, don't unions and workers on boards do the exact same thing? And you advocate for those all the time. Not really, as the dynamics are much different. Unions and workers on boards negotiating salaries and benefits packages do not artificially restrict the aggregate supply of labor in a market. Rather, they pull the negotiating power of workers to ensure workers do not face adverse and unfair labor practices on the back of monopsony power from businesses, much more effectively achieving the balancing act I described earlier. Unions and workers on boards have a vested interest in the success of a business. This is why it isn't empirically bore out that unions and workers on boards significantly decrease a company's ability to expand, nor do they significantly decrease the long-term economic growth of an economy. Restricting immigration does not help native workers in the long run empirically, but increasing workers' negotiating power with their employers does. At the same time, unions and collective bargaining agreements have been shown to make it tougher for immigrants to obtain employment in their destination country. Economists Zhang Ho and Kazuku Shirono found that the Nordic economies in response to the immigration shock they felt in 2014 and 2015 faced an additional hurdle in integrating newly arrived immigrant workers partially for this reason. Of course, this doesn't mean countries can't have robust union protection and immigration. It only means there needs to be a system in place which can handle the quick integration of immigrants should the economy economy face an immigration shock or a regular flow of immigrants over time. Ho and Kazuko write about several potential reforms, including allowing additional flexibility for collective bargaining agreements to take into account differences in sectoral wages and worker productivity, and ensuring there isn't significantly high asymmetry in terms of how the state regulates regular employees and contract workers. The authors find that these changes can help low-skilled immigrants achieve employment more quickly without sacrificing native workers' rights or employment. Something the authors praise in the Nordic economies for its role in securing employment for immigrants is their social assistance programs. They call this active labor market policies, which amount to Nordic economies providing social assistance and jobs training to newly arrived immigrants and their children. Now this doesn't mean you have to advocate for open borders, but it does mean that there are systems a country can put in place to take advantage of the long-term gains of immigration without sacrificing the native population's ability to obtain a decent wage and employment. Across all the authors I've cited today, and most any author you'll find on the subject of immigration, skeptical of immigration or otherwise, none of them recommend significantly restricting immigration to the home nation, because they recognize the long-term positive effects of immigration on an economy. That's why it's important to have systems in place that can support immigrants and the broad populace during immigration shocks. Much like most any macroeconomic issue, there are nuances worth examining and exploring with responsibility and depth, but the often far too absolutist and and a economical position of ending or restricting immigration is not properly engaging in the nuances and depth I've just described. Thanks for watching.